Um, and I have the, the pleasure of introducing Kirk Geisinger, who is the director of the Burroughs Center for Testing and the W.C. Meyer Henry Distinguished Professor at the University of Nebraska to talk to us about test adaptation. Thanks, Kirk. Thank you. Um, let me thank Amy, uh, both for the invitation and the introduction, uh, ETS and MHS. Uh, and when I was first asked uh, to do the talk, I was asked whether I was going to talk about past, present, or future. And I told her past, and that was just based on my age at the time. Uh, but, but I think I'm going to talk about all three. Um, and I decided to do this. Uh, most of the work I've done in recent years is on fairness, either for language minorities or for people with disabilities. And um, that was my initial thought of what I would talk about. But instead, I've decided to talk about uh, test adaptation, in part because uh, the International Test Commission is meeting this summer in Montreal, and I'm trying to drum up support for that. Uh, uh, and in terms of history, uh, as, as Neil started talking about when he was in this room, I think I beat him because I was an intern at ETS in 1975, and we had a meeting in here. And uh, uh, interestingly, uh, there's another person who was an intern with me uh, that same year uh, who's here, and it was amazing that they allowed uh, Linda Cook to come when she was only in junior high school at the time. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, I also was in this room. Uh, I was an intern with Warren Willingham, and then he hired me back the next year as a research associate. And uh, I joined the GRE Technical Advisory Committee in 1993. And in this room, they, uh, they brought me in a day early, so they had a, a session honoring Warren Willingham when he was um, stepping down as an officer of the organization. And that was in this room as well. So uh, it, it does have some history. Now, uh, I also have a history with the Division uh, 5 of APA. I first joined the executive committee of the, of the division in 1993, 25 years ago as well. And uh, based on discussions I had with Jim Butcher, who was then the assessment coordinator or whatever the what it's called, he was the head of the assessment group. Um, he and I got into a discussion and he asked me to do a paper for psych assessment, which he was editing at the time. And I did it on the topic of uh, test translation. And uh, it, it's the paper that I've done that I, I probably shouldn't have done because I had very little history in that topic at the time. But I was a foreign language major as an undergraduate. I knew something about translation. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'm, I'm going to say um, that some of the logic I'm going to use toward the end of the presentation is what I would call journalistic logic. <laughs> I'm using examples to make points um, that runs counter probably to the typical method of uh, Division 5. But uh, I do um, tell you that uh, July 2nd to 5th is when ITC is meeting in Montreal. And it's at the same time as a jazz uh, festival there, in case you like jazz. So uh, to give, I'm going to give a very quick overview of test adaptation. We use the word adaptation rather than translation because it's more than language. You have to involve other things other than language. And I think I will make that point very clearly to you with some examples. Uh, and, and what I'm a little different about is uh, I've actually done some work now on adaptation from one language and culture to another of some performance assessments uh, through OECD. And I'm going to show you just how difficult it is. And, and it, it fits exactly in with Neil's comments uh, over the difficulty of equating or even linking at some point, because you start questioning whether they're the same measures uh, by the time you've done some of that. Uh, why are we doing this kind of work? Well, first off, um, there are lots of testing companies right now that realize that the world has shrunk. And there are multi multinational corporations who want to administer the same tests all over the world. Um, we want to make international comparisons. Uh, I think our psychological science is getting a little stronger that allows us to do that in some cases. Uh, we've recognized the differences between etic and emic uh, kinds of measures. And there are a lot of fiscal and pragmatic reasons why it's, it may be cheaper and easier to adapt a test than it is to, to build a new one. Uh, now let me give you two precursors. And, you probably can't read the, the uh, citation there, but I got quoted in a science article um, this past year. Um, I was called and interviewed and so forth. But it turns out there was a, a, a 
retired professor in California who had built a test, well, he built a, a survey in a sense, of whether you take your medications the way you're supposed to. And it's mostly used by insurance companies as part of their tests of drugs, uh, which they have to do to get approval. And it turns out, after he retired, he got very um, sporadic about his answering of emails and letters and things like that. And he had copyrighted these scales. And he makes it very clear that they're very expensive to use, because after all, he's selling them to insurance companies. But a bunch of grad students wrote and said, can I use this for my master's thesis or doctoral dissertation? He didn't answer them, and they went ahead and used it anyhow. And he then sent them bills for upwards of $20,000 each. Uh, and the question was, is that appropriate? And it's a very complex question. It's not a simple question, because it is a copyrighted thing, and people have just used it without permission. Uh, and it was his right to do so. Now, he has since adjusted and decided that when companies use it, he's going to have one rate, and for when students and so forth, he's going to use another rate. But nevertheless, this is an important issue, because there are a lot of people that translate tests or adapt tests that they don't have the right to do so, and they don't ask for it. So, so I start off by saying, uh, if, a, if a measure is copyrighted and published, you need to get that permission first. And even if it's not copyrighted, you probably should write the, the authors and get, and at least inform them that you're planning to do that. that. I mean, that's just common courtesy, I think, professional courtesy. Now, why would you do it? And I've listed pros and cons here. And in the interest of science, I'm going to go through this really fast, um, that these are established measures that, are, uh, that make sense. Uh, that they're cost effective and cheaper, as I said. Globalization necessitates cross-culturally appropriate measures to fulfill the needs to compare, evaluate, select, treat, et cetera. Guidelines and best practice research offer more options to test users to make informed decisions and to reduce negative outcomes. The cons are that there can be copyright issues and count, uh, country membership requirements, and I think ETS has dealt with some of those copyright issues I know over the, over the years. Uh, that they, you have to ask, do the benefits justify the efforts? Um, and is there a real need to have the same measure in a different language? Um, that fairness and validity of scores for target populations and use must be normed on the, on the target demographic issues. And translated assessments, even with careful adaptation, still introduce additional negative psychometric and cross-cultural issues. And one of the ways that I had run into this is I was an expert witness in two court cases in Canada oh, 25 years ago. And the, the witness on the other side was John Hunter, who some of you know. And uh, what happened is all their tests were built in English, but then they had to translate them into French because they are a, a bilingual country. And the French students, or the French candidates, did about 3% worse than the English-speaking candidates. And when I asked why, I was told it was because the French schools are not as good as the English schools. And later on was told that I was indeed right, that it was a translation issue that, that they, the, the questions made more sense in English the way they were written first, and when they were translated, they didn't do as well. And so essentially, it was a built-in bias uh, against the, the French-speaking uh, uh, candidates. Uh, but we do, and OECD, which is the publisher of PISA and a bunch of the other surveys, um, and they have done some in recent years on critical thinking, engineering, and economics at the higher ed level, which people are not as familiar with. And, and I've worked on the critical thinking one, which is what I'm going to give you examples of. Um, people want to make comparisons. And I'm going to make the argument that some of those comparisons are less sophisticated than we'd like to think. Uh, so what are the skills you need to adapt a measure? Well, certainly you need to be fluent in both languages. You need a comprehensive understanding of the construct being assessed. Uh, you need a thorough understanding of both cultures. You have to have some ability to work on test and measures. There are skills involved with writing items and so forth. And I'm going to tell you, I gave a keynote at the uh, Mexican National Academy of Assessment a couple of years ago. And I learned they've taken a very different model than the United States has. Um, they have some uh, 89 languages that are from indigenous people that make up only 5.4% of the population. But they have schools representing about 20 different indigenous languages. And the decision they've made, rather than the United States, is that all indigenous people will be taught in their own language and tested in their own language. 
So their national assessment group has to translate all their tests to about 20 languages um, besides Spanish um, and, and instruction. And in fact, of those 20 languages, 10 of them didn't even have a written language. So the first thing the Mexican government had to do was to develop those languages into written languages before they could even uh, decide that they were going to uh, test in them so, uh, or instruct in them. So um, it's a very different model. And in, in it's a model that I'm actually very comfortable with. And I think if we were going to build a wall, maybe we ought to do it the other way, keep us from going to Mexico. Uh, but I also note that in South Africa, uh, they have 11 official languages. So when they uh, build a test, they have to build it into 11 languages right off the bat. Uh, now, uh, what do we want in a translation or an adaptation? Well, the idea initially, anyhow, was that item difficulty should be the same within reason uh, across languages, that sociolinguistic nuances should be uh, removed or avoided. Content relevance and access should be comparable across cultures. The construct relevance and validity should be constant. Uh, we should focus on the defined objectives and the purpose. That formatting uh, appearance and comparable tasks should be the same. And to avoid really bad practices. Uh, now, to give you a sense of this, the first study I did in this regard was with a graduate student many years ago who studied the EWOP, which is the uh, Waste Adult Intelligence Scale. The initial form was translated by, uh, into Spanish in Puerto Rico. And uh, for example, you may know in giving the waste, the first test you usually gave was the vocabulary. And they go from easy to hard. And that decides what you're going to do. Well, with the initial version of the way Iwa, they simply translated these, the English words into Spanish. And there was no longer any reasonable rank ordering of difficulty, because once you've done the translation. But that's how it was. It was just the same words in the different language. Now, that's, in my mind, an unbelievably bad practice. Um, and, and I'm going to give you, Ron Hamilton has two examples that he uses frequently. Uh, one of these uh, comes from uh, Pisa's fourth grade science test. And the question asked is, uh, why do ducks swim so well? <laughs> the students that do uh, the best on that are the Swedes in the world. And it turns out when you translate um, webbed feet, which is the right answer in English, uh, in, in Swedish, that's swimming feet. <laughs> so uh, now there's also another question that he's often used um, that was, there's a technique which I'm going to talk about in a minute called back translation, where you translate it to a new language and then you back translate to see how it looks and how comparable it is. And it was essentially an analogy question that was out of sight, colon, out of mind. Translated back, that comes to blind and insane. <laughs> so you can see this is not, I mean, everybody in test construction knows that test construction is both art and science. And like Neil was just talking about the science part of it, I'm going to talk a little more about the art part of it, because that's, that's what we're talking about. I mean, among the translation processes, you can have simple translation, which is what a lot of tests like the EWA uh, used initially. Uh, they can have adaptation with checks, and that's where usually you do this kind of a back translation to decide what to do. And I just looked up uh, back translation. Pierce was first developed as a technique by Brizlin in 1970, so it's been around for a while. There are people, when I edited the uh, handbook of uh, uh, assessment, testing and assessment in psychology. Um, there are people that had chapters in there like Butcher who still say that back translation is the state of the art. Uh, most people would disagree with that now uh, simply because if you're a translator and you know you're going to be evaluated by the quality of your translation, what happens is you translate the question not to be optimal in the target language, but to be op optimally translated back to the original language. And those are two very different things. OK, so, so, so back translation has some problems. Uh, in the article that I wrote in Psych Assessment, I argued that those skills that I listed are unlikely to be found well in one person. And so you need committee approaches to doing this. This has to be done by more than one person. And uh, Kadre Ersakan, who's also a vice president here at ETS, has uh, wrote a chapter for my handbook uh, on, on concurrent ways of doing this, is, which is what OECD is trying to do this, where you build the tests 
in the same in different languages at the same time. Um, and I think I've just said that. Basically, it doesn't work for pre-existing measures, which a lot of the test <coughs> translation work is done on measures that achieve a certain amount of notoriety in, a, in target typic, uh, in the initial language, usually English. Um, but in this concurrent model, what happens is you develop two forms at the same time. You have groups working together. Um, th they work with a shell. It's malleable so that they can change it as they go. Now, if you can imagine two committees doing that, that's not so hard. But if you start thinking about Mexico and you think about 89 committees doing that, it's, it's unimaginable in my mind, you know, uh, or even 11 perhaps in South Africa. Um, so it's very difficult once you get more than two. Now one of the things we forget about is culture, and culture has a big impact, especially when you get into personality variables and things like that. But the examples I'm going to give you journalistically, uh, in performance assessments, I would argue that there's a lot of cultural issues that affect those responses too. Uh, we heard uh, in an earlier talk that length is one of the big characteristics that assess uh, the quality of essays. Well, length might be a very culturally dependent kind of variable, as an example. So if you're going across languages or cultures, uh, you might find big differences. Uh, and as someone who's traveled to a variety of English-speaking countries, including South Africa, I will tell you there are big cultural differences even as you start going across uh, some of those uh, countries. So in this 1994 article that I wrote, I listed steps for, for adapting a measure. And uh, I'm going to go through them really fast. First, you translate or adapt the measure. That sounds like it should be the whole thing. Then you review the translated measure. Three, you revise that measure based on comments from the review. Then you pilot. That's a small scale testing. Then field tests, standardized scores, perform validation uh, research as appropriate, develop a manual and other documents for users of the assessment, train users, and uh, collect reactions from users. Now, I, mo I, I note that Ursa Khan and Lyons Thomas, which were the people who wrote the chapter for my, my handbook, um, had some other steps, and I'm, I'm not going to go through them. But, but uh, shortly after I wrote that article, which was really one of the first um, things on how to, how to adapt measures, Hamilton and Petzula uh, suggested that I left a few things out, which included hiring the appropriate <laughs> translators, ensuring construct equivalents, and that's something Barbara Byrne has written quite a bit about, and, and I would encourage you to take a look at her work. Um, and then even to decide whether or not to adapt or to build a new, and, and whether to link scores across, and I'm going to come back to that. And in another article I've written, I've pointed out that I think there are real scoring issues that have to be addressed across uh, versions, too. And uh, so I think there are lots of different things we could add to that. It certainly wasn't something that came down on a tablet. Uh, in terms of, and the, this is where quantitative and qualitative clearly um, get involved. Uh, you have to have reviews of the assessment for usability, reviews of the instrument for comparability, uh, pretests with relevant individuals, timing, and, and we know that culturally there are huge differences in terms of people's consideration of time and how important time is, uh, suitability of instructions, uh, and questions about the appropriateness of certain uh, items and, and so forth. Uh, Willie Solano Flores, with whom I've worked on some of the projects we're talking about here, um, has defined something called test translation error, the lack of equivalence between the source language version and the target language version of test items. Uh, due to the nature of languages, it's possible that an adapted form of assessment does not capture or transfer nuances. And uh, psychometric error consequence is that the adapted version potentially tests different constructs than the original form, or tests them slightly differently. Um, so what kinds of research is needed after adaptation? Certainly, you need to check reliability in a variety of different ways. And unfortunately, <coughs> because it's so easy, we frequently only do uh, internal consistency anymore. But I think test, retest, and other things to note whether it's a state or a trait, for example, uh, are also important. Uh, item analysis is important. Um, factor analysis of items, SEM analyses, and that's what Barbara uh, pushes. Uh, and then secondarily, there I've got the SEM. Uh, fairness analyses, although uh, one of my former students, Steve Cerisi, who many of you know, uh, 
he's talked a lot. He actually used to do workshops on using diff in, in adapted and translated measures, but more recently has come up with the idea it's probably not appropriate to do diff analyses across uh, versions because what you're doing is you're confounding two variables with no ability to separate them. You have group differences and translation differences, and those are completely and totally confounded, so you can't uh, uh, separate them. He and uh, Swami Nathan have written that up, um, looking at norms. And, and then there's the possibility of linking, and I should note uh, that Linda and Bill Angoff, I think Linda Cook and Bill Angoff, um, did probably the best known um, linking study, uh, I think on the Spanish version of the SAT to the English version back maybe 20 years ago or so, 25. Um, now beyond validity, and this came up earlier, there's the term of utility and usefulness. And, and my favorite example of this is the Canadian SAT. Now there's probably only one or two people that even know that there was a Canadian SAT in this room. Uh, but in the, in the 60s, uh, the Ontario Institute for Studies of Education decided they were going to build an SAT, and ETS sent up, sent up a lot of consultants to work with them, and they built a very nice Canadian SAT. And when they were all done, the Canadian government decided students shouldn't pay for it, the university should pay for it if they wanted. So all the costs were going to be distributed to the universities, and at that point, they decided no one wanted to use it, and so it went away. So all the development costs were for naught, and, and that's, in my mind, a classic case of poor utility and poor planning. Uh, but there are, there are other cases. You have to decide, is it really worth doing this from a whole variety of purposes? And then the question, does it make sense to equate or link tests across languages? And perhaps if the questions are really similar and you have a lot of other uh, information that you know about, it might make sense. What's or just read an essay that I Okay, the slides get better? Okay. I thought it was making it easier for people to sleep, but um, <laughs> let's see. Um, the decision um, demands really a very high level of test and psychometric equivalence. Um, you must be convinced that those tests are really highly comparable. And most equating designs have much more rigorous requirements, as Neil just uh, explained, than we have in adaptation studies. Uh, and there's a good article in Ed Measurement Issues and Practice uh, entitled Problems and Issues in Linking Assessments Across Languages by Cerisi and others. Um, what we need to know when we're adapting a measure is one, are the constructs equivalent? You need to know that even before you get into the measure itself. Do we have these same constructs in different cultures? Are they equally meaningful in different cultures? Then are the tests equivalent in those different cultures and are the testing conditions and so forth the same, and all those really need to be established. Um, Grise noted that adaptation errors are most prevalent source of diff in international assessments, and he said that uh, we know that even state to state there are some curricular differences, but when you go across countries there are huge curricular differences. Uh, then there are cultural biases and translation errors, all of which uh, uh, cause, cause some real issues. Now the International Test Commission built uh, is, is famous really for its test adaptation guidelines. They came out a few years ago in their second edition, and these are to promote good practice in test adaptation. Uh, you may know that ITC, the International Test Commission, was developed uh, initially because of European countries um, as, as Europe became uh, the European what is it, Union. They, uh, they, you can now move easily across countries and so forth, so that people need to take tests in different languages, and so um, they've, they've put out really simple, easy to understand guidelines, uh, and they're all freely available and downloadable, and they now have like six sets of guidelines. Uh, this is to ensure a level playing field for testing across national boundaries and to provide a mechanism whereby test users can observe their duty of care to the public without regard to national boundaries. Um, I do believe documentation is important. And that's one of those things that has increasingly become difficult to find in the testing world. Lots of tests don't have manuals anymore. Uh, I know Wayne Kamara told me a few years ago that the College Board had decided, well, we're doing the research, but we don't have to pull it all together into a single book. Uh, you know, I, I think users need information that's easily available and so forth. Uh, now, I'm going to get into the adaptation issues. Some of you may know. Uh, 
the critical thinking component of the, the AHILA, which stands for, let's see if I can get it, uh, Assessment of Higher Education Learning Outcomes in English. Uh, it's not as well known as PISA and so forth. Uh, used the CLA, the Collegiate, Collegiate Learning Assessment, which you also may know is a outcomes assessment measure used by some 1,300 colleges in the United States. It's now the CLA Plus. Uh, it was based actually on a GRE model in a sense. It's a performance assessment where you read three or four pages of material and then you write an essay. And it, it, is, it used to be scored, it isn't anymore, but it used to be scored in English by the GRE's um, uh, assessment, uh, automated assessment. Uh, now Burroughs was, was hired um, to translate this into a variety of languages or to work with national committees South Korea, Slovakia, Egypt, Colombia, and so forth, um, and a few other countries. Now, it's an essay, you read this problem. The problem that they used internationally was that there's a, two lakes, there's a river between them, you want to harness water power as it goes from one lake to the other across the river, but there's an endangered fish that lives in that river. And so there's no right answer to this, but the thought is you have to write an essay that describes you're sensitive to the fish and you understand the need for power and things like that. And I should note it's a company and it's a for-profit company that, that wants to harness the power. Uh, so, so we worked with these different countries with teams of people in the country to work on those translations. Now, Slovakia, as an example, was a Western country used to be part of Czechoslovakia. They're a NATO country. There were almost no problems there at all. It translated very easily into their language. It made sense to them and so forth. Now, Kuwait, Richard Chagelson had, had done the translation there the year before. And they have no rivers, no lakes. The students don't know anything about water power. And so the way the problem was changed was this became a seagoing fish and they were trying to harness ocean power. Now, that starts changing the question. It's now no longer the same thing and it's introducing a new concept as opposed to a concept that people uh, may know about. Now, Colombia was another country and, and Willie Solano Flores uh, worked with us on this one. Um, and years ago, I knew that when we talked about the, turning the GRE into Spanish, we were told we'd need at least three different versions of Spanish. And indeed, Colombia needed a different version from Mexico that had already translated it. Uh, and uh, and it, was, it was mostly the same, but just different words being inserted. Now then we get to South Korea. South Korea uh, said they had a great adaptation, a great translation. But our analysis of the data showed that it made no sense. It was almost random data, it looked like. Uh, and yet. So I was charged to find out why this was not working. And it just so happened I had a doctoral student who was later an ETS intern by the name of Hai Sun Lee. And she is now done and she teaches in the California State University system. Uh, and she read it and said this doesn't make any sense because there's no power companies in South Korea. The government supplies the power and, it's, and, and it isn't something that people pay for in the same kind of way that they do in the United States. So they had to change the, the question. And once we changed it to the government, suddenly the data came out much better. So they had, they had done more of a, of a literal translation of that component, and it, it just didn't work. Uh, now then we get to Egypt. And I did this one uh, with Willie Solano, by the way. Uh, and we had an Arabic version already. Uh, based on Kuwait, but we were told that Kuwait spoke high Arabic and Egypt spoke low Arabic. I'm not sure what that difference is, but uh, that happens in a lot of countries. And so we, we knew we had to at least do that. Now, obviously, unlike Kuwait, they have the Nile running right through Cairo, so they, they know rivers and lakes. Uh, and we actually did think aloud, as much as you would do with students with disabilities, and we watched two people. It's, it's interesting to watch people in, uh, doing this in Arabic when you don't speak it, but we got translations back. Uh, and the biggest problem they said is their power is also provided by the government, but they said no one in the government would ever ask for our input as a consultant. It just would never happen. The government believes it knows all the answers. And basically, 
the bottom line is, uh, and I, I want to just mention too, we did this at the tail end of the revolution and there was gunfire in the background while we were doing this. And it was, that, and you know, to get into our hotel, you had to go through metal screeners and have dog sniffers on the car and stuff like that. It was really quite uh, fascinating. Um, so their solution was to make this into the United States, that you're a <laughs> consultant to a company in the United States doing this, because they thought in the United States people might actually ask, uh, answer, ask questions. I'm not, for the interest of time, I'm not going to go through these methodological issues. Uh, I'm, I'm told that I'm, I'm getting really short. But our experience looking at some adapted measures is that some users try to translate the validation from English and just say it's the same. The MMPI has done that, for example. We just believe the validation research is the same as it was in English. Uh, sometimes they do it in a couple of countries and then they assume, well, if it's, if it's true in Mexico and it's true in Spain, well, then it would be true all over the world. And that, that's problematic. Um, some scales even use the same norms from the original language. Uh, let's see, where they do have norms, it's usually a much smaller and less representative sample. That was true on the IWA, which was done on a very disproportionate sample in Puerto Rico, uh, and that there become uh, lots of other fit issues. Uh, we believe OECD uses national expert committees. They have double translation, which means two people are actually translating the measure, or two groups, and then they compare the two translated measures uh, for comparability, uh, and they have either cross-checks or uh, reconciliation. Uh, we think, uh, again, I'm going to skip this one, I think, but there are reasons why this is continuing on. Uh, context measures uh, matters. Uh, and we know in some countries, for example, a huge proportion, like the United States, actually a huge proportion of people go to college and universities. There are some other countries where it might only be 5 or 10 percent of the population. So then when you're comparing, you have very uh, unusual um, comparisons. Um, there's lots of economic factors, cultures, perceptions, linguistics, structures, styles. Um, there are countries where men and women go to different universities, for example. Uh, so my themes uh, as a whole, um, that adapted measures have a huge appeal. They have great potential. They have huge financial worth for testing companies. Uh, but we need to conduct more and better research on adapted measures. And I question uh, whether a lot of uh, cross-national, cross-language equatings will be possible or even meaningful. So thank you very much.